Darling Nikki, Tipper Gore's go-to Prince song is the Purple Rain track we're going to be discussing on this episode of the Press Rewind Prince Lyrics Podcast. Returning to the show to help me break down this notorious song it is Laura Tebert. Welcome back to the show, Laura. Hey, great to be here, Jason. Thank you. Thank you for joining me again. Um, you know, it's been a little bit. We talked last during the free episode from 1999. I'm excited to have you here for Darling Nikki. It's um, an epic song, a pivotal moment in the film, and it's just a very exciting. It's um, upbeat. I think we have a lot to talk about with this one. Oh, yeah. I am so ready to dig in. I mean, Free was, uh, you know, Free is this sort of ethereal, kind of very conceptual, spiritual song. And then now we're getting real earthy with Darla Nikki. So let's do yeah. it. Yeah. And as I mentioned in the opening, it's I, I alluded to Tipper Gore and I also alluded to being a, a notorious song. I think just very briefly, because that's not really the purpose of the episode, but I did want to mention to those who uh, maybe aren't as familiar with the history behind the song, but uh, the song was listed as one of the quote unquote filthy 15, meaning that it was a song kind of highlighted for its its uh, lyrical content. Didn't always have to be explicit to be on the filthy 15 or even sexual in nature. Some songs that were chosen to be Ident or that were identified on this list um, had imagery from like violent imagery or drug references, but many of them were sexual in nature. But at that time, it was identified as one of those songs that really kind of sparked the um, the explicit lyrics, parental advisory stickers, and and uh, the PMRC was created in response to this as well as other songs. And uh, I just wanted to mention that because of its, it is considered a fairly notorious song for that reason. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, Tipper Gore in particular was you know, unsettled by, you know, Prince's uh, talk of masturbation. And that's what made this a target and created, you know, caused her to kind of create this whole parents music resource center and, you know, create these advisory stickers for albums with explicit lyrics. And, you know, I think she just at one point said she found it so vulgar and she was embarrassed for her. And I think it was Karenna is her daughter that was listening to it at the time. She was 11. And, um, you know, Karenna Gore uh, is actually 46 now, if you want to feel really old. So mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she still listens to Prince. She started out right. <laughs> So. Yeah, I'm I'm a year younger than her, so I was also very young when I heard this song, and my parents were aware of the lyrics, or at least my mom was, because we would all listen to it together. My mom, my older sister, and myself would listen to this record pretty pretty regularly, pretty frequently in 1984, early 85, and uh, the lyrics, I was never told to cover my ears, I was never told to turn it off when it was being played it was kind of like one of those Ooh, wow okay <laughs> but it was never so bad that i was being asked to to like leave the room when the song came on uh, so i'm thankful for that because uh, i think for me and we'll as we go through the lyrics it'll be very interesting this song confused the hell out of me as a kid i think i was still maybe at 10 years old a little too young nine and ten a little too young to really understand what a lot of what is being said in the song truly meant and i was forced to kind of make things up in my head what i thought they meant <laughs> which you know you kids do i mean if they're, if they're not sure what a meaning is then they're going to come up with their own meaning based off of context clues based off of delivery based off of what how it's used in in the song and so i think a lot of those is what i had to do as well for yourself laura what kind of memories do you have of this song hearing it back at the time it came out or, you know, in that time frame, do you have any different thoughts about it now? Or are you as equally confused as me? <laughs> <laughs> I was a little older, so I wasn't, you know, I was more clued in to the actual meaning, you know, and I, I, I thought we were, sh I, I just remember being, sh being sort of stunned by it, but also just um, tantalized, you know, I, mm -hmm. this is, I mean, as a teenager would be right. I mean, teenagers love anything like that, that shakes up the adults. And we loved it. We loved it. We thought it was, it was right on. And, and I think Purple Rain as a movie, you know, as a, it needed a, 
a song that that embodied danger, you know, like it had that element of danger, you know, and, and we loved it. Yeah. So I being a little bit older, I, I think I had a, a head more of teenagers thrill, you know, thrilling you know, perspective on it. Yeah. Yeah. My my sister, who's a few years older than me, uh, she, I'm sure she felt the same way because, you know, it was at that time she was probably around ninth grade, 10th grade. And it just had that uh, just enough danger, just enough pushback, push against the status quo of what what pop music could be and what people could say in music. I mean, it was kind of like one of those things where, oh, can you can you say that? Can you get away with that? I didn't know you could do that. I mean, somebody has to be the first one to to really push the envelope. Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, 1980 by 1984, there were obviously swear words and songs. I mean, Prince did it several years prior, you know, in the Dirty Mind album, said said the F word in Dirty Mind. So it's not like this is the first song that Prince even recorded that had lyrics that pushed the envelope. But for for many people, I think it might have been one of the first instances where they where they could have heard that or would have heard that, especially if they were fans of popular music and not really listening to some of the more alternate forms of music that were out there that could have had lyrics of this nature in existence. You know, I I read too a quote from Lisa Coleman who uh, who said that Prince, you know, played the song for her and then said, can I get away with this? You know, I don't know that Prince knew if he could get away with it. But um, you know, there's a great interview at the end of Prince's life when he goes on the Arsenio Hall show in 2014. And he told Arsenio that, you know, in the beginning, especially when he was young, um, he was trying to see how much he could get away with. And he said, um, he said to Arsenio, when you're 20 years old, you're looking for the ledge. You want to see how far you can push everything. As an artist, I just went there just to find it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he he was daring. He was trying to find what is what is the boundary? You know, where who's going to, you know, like, is anyone going to stop me? (laughs) Can I say this? You know, um, so and and you're right. I think there was a, a line that he was he was playing with. You know, can I say this? But then I back off and I I sort of allude to something else, you know. So it's uh, yeah, it's fun to see Prince play with these ideas in this song. And um, I give him credit. You know, I give him credit. I think it it took a lot of daring. And I I think it really, um, you know, I, I look at all these Purple Rain songs very much in context with the movie. Right. Because they were a yeah. lot of them were written to specifically to the movie. And it's perfect. It's perfect at that point in the movie when, um, you know, Apollonia has sort of left Prince to go join Morris's band. And, and you know, Prince wants revenge. He's going to hurt her. He's going to get her where it hurts. Right. Mm-hmm. So. But we'll get into more of that as we as we analyze the lyrics. Yeah, and just uh, adding on to your your topic about pushing the envelope and really trying, like Prince saying, he was just trying to see what he could get away with. I I think that probably, you know, he he obviously went further earlier in his career with songs like Sister, um, songs like Head, songs like uh, Lady Cab Driver, Let's Pretend We're Married. But as he became po- more popular and bigger in, in the mainstream eye, I think he probably was thinking he was going to be able to get away with less and less of that. <laughs> I, yeah. mean, I mean, if, if it was me, if I was an up and coming artist and I was really pushing envelopes and doing this, sure, if I'm only selling, you know, 200,000, 300,000 copies of my of my album and I'm only filling small venues just trying to make a name for myself that's one thing but once you become this this global phenomenon uh headlining box office and releasing an album that's targeted to you know be one of the biggest sellers of the year and it ends up being not only that but one of the biggest sellers of all time then the pressure's really different you know I mean you have a lot more pressure to succeed and not make too many enemies in the process because you want that next project to get greenlit, all that momentum kind of goes away. And so he, he had some legit concerns about what he could do 
in the purple rain era versus what he could do in the dirty mind era, for example, I would, I would imagine. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Warner yeah. Brothers had a lot riding on this, you know, right. I mean, he had a lot riding yeah. on this as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're right. There were a lot more eyeballs on him and uh, yeah, he wasn't this sort of underground artist anymore. He was, he was going to hit the mainstream and, you know, be much more in the media and in the public eye. I mean, uh, even the eye of the moral majority <laughs> probably hadn't, you know, listened to Dirty Mind. Um, but yeah, this this propelled him to a to a larger stage. I mean, I do think, uh, you know, as we think about the the bigger picture effect of a song like Darling Nikki, that the media did somewhat paint him as I don't want to say bad, but you know, Michael Jackson is kind of good and Prince is sort of bad or dirty well, or you know so yeah, I, he was I, certainly painted as like sex obsessed i would uh-huh. say yeah i did i think he did i think that was somewhat a repercussion um but you know i, I did it hurt prince at all no i you know i i don't think so um mm-hmm. but you know definitely gave him a reputation i i think too i don't know if you saw this that in um in the beautiful ones the uh prince's memoir they taught, you know, Dan Peepenbring talked a little bit about Darlin' Nikki and Dan noted, I thought this was kind of cool, that in 2001, I mean, Prince kept referencing Tipper Gore throughout his career, right? <laughs> and <laughs> and um, when he announced Celebration at Paisley Park, the very first one in 2001, he he was explaining, you know, this is going to be a family friendly event. And, um, you know, he'd, he'd renounced profanity. And his quote was, even Tipper Gore can come. So, <laughs> he, nice. yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. Prince got the last word on that. I, I, I was happy to read that. Oh yeah, I mean, being added, being having the song added to that list, the Filthy Fifteen, and being called out for its uh, sexuality, absolutely did nothing to hurt his career. Did nothing to hurt the success of this album. No, nope. uh, I mean, I, that's as right. we know, it probably had a very uh, opposite effect. I would imagine Prince had another song on the filthy 15. He maybe had two other songs, but um, uh, one that he wrote for Sheena Easton. Yeah. Sugar walls. Yep. Sugar walls. Yeah. Prince was Prince had a couple. I think there might have been a vanity. Uh, there was a vanity, but it wasn't one that he was associated with. Uh, it was, OK, uh, it was from her solo debut after she left the Prince camp. I mean, Nasty Girl could have easily made. Yeah, why did Nasty Girl not make the list? I feel like there should have been more Prince songs on the list. Yeah, Nasty <laughs> Girl could have easily made the list. Come on. I think maybe if Nasty Girl would have come out like that year in 84, it would have made it. I think by the time this list was made, that song was already kind of like two years in the past and it wasn't yeah. getting the same kind of traction. Uh, but it easily could have made it. I mean, <laughs> considering considering a song like Dress You Up by Madonna was on the list and that seems What's wrong with that song? I mean, it seems very innocuous to me. <laughs> I read some lyrics innocuous. like exactly where is this song dirty? <laughs> I didn't I quite know. understand, but But the Mary Jane girls were on there. So mm-hmm. yes, Rick James, there you go. And uh yeah, I mean for sure. We could just have a filthy fifteen just from Prince, maybe a filthy fifty. I mean, come on, we could come up with that list. Easily, that would be fun. Easily. That would be a good playlist. Yes, it would. And this <laughs> is a great song. I mean, for me, I, I, well, I love the entire album, obviously, but this song has always been a standout to me. Uh, it was a standout to me when I was younger because of its just the direction it takes, its lyrics. It was it was kind of cool. It was it was dangerous. It was dirty even though I wasn't sure exactly why <laughs> I just knew it was dirty. Okay. Um, but as I've grown older, I've come to appreciate it for its composition, uh, just how it's being performed. And as you mentioned, it's really hard to, to um, remove how the song is used in the film from the song itself. Mm. I mean, at the time I didn't I hadn't watched the film, but now that I've seen the film countless times this song and the visuals behind it uh, are very much in, intertwined for me personally um, and just uh, just i'm gonna before i mention anything else i just want to do a little bit of setting the stage here this is the last track on side a so if you have the vinyl or if you have the cassette this is how side a ends and also 
as you met, as you mentioned, Laura, in the film, the kid is singing this song to Apollonia as she enters the club with Morris. He is upset at her for choosing Morris um, from a professional standpoint. I mean, she hasn't chosen him from a romantic standpoint, but he doesn't really care. I think he's um, just kind of blinded by the the anger he feels towards her for even associating with Morris whatsoever. And they've had a they had a they had a fight, you know, just before this in the movie. So, you know, he's pretty upset. And this song now is the song that's going to be played in an effort to kind of embarrass her, maybe humiliate her, as, as it appears as if he's singing the song directly to her. When you listen to this song, Laura, and you're like thinking of it in the context of the film, is there anything that stands out to you about it? I mean, it's cold. You know, as a, as a female, if it just, just imagining a male's, singing or saying any of these things to you, that is cold. I mean, it hurts, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a vengeful song. It really is. And at the same time, I feel like it's this brilliant trifecta of songs to me, you know, the beautiful ones, computer blue and darling Nikki, like those are three points of this triangle, this trifecta of incredible love songs i i mean i would argue that darling nikki is a love song so um i like the pace of it i like the sing song melody line i mean and you know he's i think in a way he's he you know he's kind of being i don't know if caddy is the word but it's it's sort of like he's up on stage showing off and going you know hey you had me but other people, you know, other women want me too, and um, it, it's just intriguing the way he plays this. And you know, it's it's like you have to have the visual, you have to see him do this live. You know, it's lit red in the movie. The lighting is red, and it's just yeah, it's got this angry, um, passionate feel that it's really, really well done moment in the movie. And of course it just devastates Apollonia and she, she flees the club before he's even done with the song. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. She does. She, she can't even stomach, you know, to get to the ending. You know, she has to, she has to leave halfway through because she feels, like I said, kind of humiliated by it. I mean, he's, he's staring at her. He's um, making it very clear to anybody who's in the, in the club at the time that he's, the kids singing this to her. And so even if it's, it's a fictional story, but anybody listening, you know, any third parties looking in on this are going to think this girl must have done something to this guy. And, you know, is she really a sex fiend? Is she really a dirty girl, you know? And that's kind of what he's, he's trying to shame her for that, which, you know, in these days it's, it shouldn't be considered shameful for liking sex, you know, and, and, and enjoying sex it really also depends on how it's delivered. Right. So this, like you said, this song can be a love song depending on how it's delivered because there's nothing wrong with enjoying casual sex per se. It's just when it's delivered in a way that makes the person sound like it was like a transaction. Ooh. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that is what's cold about it. You're right. It's just like a, like a, a, a cold transaction. Also like, I get images of like locker locker room talk. Like this is Prince bragging about an encounter he had, like this really sexually adventurous woman, super liberated, like, wow, she taught me some things. And can you imagine? This is what she did. Like guys just bragging about their sexual conquests. But in this case, it was more like he was con like he was the conquest in some cases. Yes. But, but speaking as a man, there's, that that's always been kind of, you know, that's appealing in some ways as well, like to almost be treated like a conquest. And he I get the sense like he's talking to friends like this. But instead of it just being a real private conversation between him and a couple buddies, the woman happens to be overhearing it. And can you imagine how upset that person would be if they're overhearing you know, locker room talk. I mean, it's always been kind of one of those things where you see it sometimes in movies where somebody hears, overhears somebody else, like their partner talking about her or him to their friends. And it's 
especially if it's not always complimentary. It can be, like you said, very devastating to that person. You're right. I mean, I think he he turned um, things on its on their head by by almost, you know, making himself the conquest. Right. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, yeah. Is he heartbroken because he was just another conquest of hers? And that's so unsettling, I think. And you can, you know, see it in the movie, the way Apollonia, um, you know, is just traumatized by it and confused and confused. Right. Yeah. Uh, she doesn't see it coming, but it's like he's he's um, he's obviously the way he's acting on stage is, you know, intended to tick her off. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's got layers. But, you know, she she just leaves crying because she's so just traumatized and confused by the whole thing. And, you know, that is the one point if you watch the film and by the way, it's on Netflix right now. So it's easy to just go check out yep. you know, Darling Nikki, right. Or something, but she, she flees the club. And then that's the moment where Prince says, come back, Nikki, come back. Your darling little Prince wants to grind. And so at that point it does, you know, it's a little confusing because it's called Darling Nikki. And he's singing it to Apollonia and, you know, you're like, wait, is he talking about cheating on Apollonia with another woman or what is going on? But then he very directly says, come back, Nikki, come back. And then you go, ooh, I think this was about Apollonia. You know, I think it it could be confusing for a sort of a casual viewer to figure that out. Yeah, especially if you're listening to the song outside the context of the film, you're kind of wondering, who is this Nikki character? Mm. Uh, I don't know any Nikki character in the film. <laughs> I mean, who, no. who is this? Oh, but then when you watch it, like you said, you kind of get it. It's it's really being sung about Apollonia in the context of the film. He just didn't want to, or you know, wasn't going to make it that obvious, um, even though it was based off of his actions and how he sang the song to her. It wasn't going to be quite that on the nose, I guess, by calling it "Darling Apollonia." <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of a mouthful. Hey, yeah. is it? Have you heard that? Um, is this just a rumor that Vanity's name in the movie was supposed to be Nicolette, or is that just a is that just a rumor, or was that is there any foundation to that? Because I read that a little bit on the on Prince dot org. I have not read that. I didn't know that. Ah, well, so, yeah, that was one. That's one theory, and I don't know what the truth to it is. I wasn't able to confirm that, but it'd be interesting if any listeners know. Um, you know, that's that's what some people say that um, you know, when Vanity left the movie, he didn't bother to change the name of the song because, you know, like you said, I mean, Darling Apollonia doesn't have the same ring as Darling Nikki, so yeah, yeah, one theory anyway. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Good good yeah. question. And and Prince has done this story song before. This isn't the first time he's done a story song with a very sexually aggressive female. I mean, we've got Little Red Corvette. We've got, mm-hmm. I mean, even going back to Uptown from Dirty Mind. Oh, yeah. yeah. She shows him around. She shows him a thing or two. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, and so it's this is not this is not an unusual theme that Prince has kind of gone back to a few times. I mean, you can even say Lady Cab Driver. He's yeah. one of those story songs with a very sexually aggressive female. So I guess if you don't have anything more, we can start diving into the lyrics. Let's just start going yeah, through it. Yeah, let's dive in. Okay. So the first verse of the song is, I knew a girl named Nikki. I guess you could say she was a sex fiend. I met her in a hotel lobby masturbating with a magazine. She said, how'd you like to waste some time? And I could not resist when I saw a little Nikki grind. <laughs> Okay, so this is this is the 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 verse that caused the most controversy at the time because of the use of the word masturbating. Right. Right. But, and also sex fiend, labeling uh Nikki as a sex fiend, that's kind of pushing the envelope a little bit too, I guess. Yeah, uh, and I think he uses it as a compliment. <laughs> doesn't he? I guess it's debatable. But yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, the fact that he opens um, with these lines and he's just singing openly about female masturbation. I mean, come on, that's so important. You Mm -hmm. know, it's just so significant. Nobody was talking about that stuff. And 
Um, you know, just giving giving women room to be allowed, you know, and he did that so beautifully with this song. I think it's really significant. He was just so far ahead of his, you know, his peers in in this kind of expression of female sexuality. This is groundbreaking. I love it. I love it. It it's it shook people up, you know, and that's that was his intention, I think. Yeah, and I agree, and that's why I think it's really important to make note that even though the song is meant to to shame Apollonia's character in the film, I don't think that this song should be considered uh, an anti uh, female sexuality or you know something that is meant to um, shame women in general for being very sexual or having you know desires to masturbate or having desires to be in charge of a sexual encounter, you know, like taking ownership of that and and taking ownership of their own pleasure. I don't think that that should be kind of the takeaway from this Mm -mm. is Prince wanted to uh, shame women who looked at sex in this way. Would you agree with that? Oh, I totally agree. I mean, it doesn't feel... I mean, I I think Prince's views on female sexuality were so far out ahead of anything that was being done at that time. And, um, you know, it it's it was eye opening and refreshing, honestly, as a as a female, as a young female listening to that at the time. I mean, he was elevating women. Remember that Wendy and Lisa were groundbreaking as well. I had never seen women in a band elevated to that level of importance. I'm not kidding. It just didn't exist. So no, I mean, never, ever get this misogynistic feeling from Prince. I really, you know, no, it wasn't. It, it's complex, right? Because it, it, it was in a way kind of vengeful against Apollonia, but it was not in any way shameful about female sexuality. Yeah, it can be if, if it's misinterpreted, it can be looked at a bit misogynistic. But I think we both agree and hopefully most listeners agree that despite its nasty kind of approach towards this woman because of their kind of, you know, used and thrown, thrown out, you know, yeah. it, it just flips. It just really flips the, the gender roles because that has been stereotypically men have been looked at as users of women for sex and this is completely the opposite approach to that. He's he's being used by for sex and whether or not he feels bad about it or whether or not he's like, OK, that, I mean, that was that was a thing that happened to me and I I enjoyed it and I'm I'm cool with how it ended. Yeah, it really just depends on your interpretation of the song. But we know in the movie it's meant to do a certain thing, but take it out of the movie and it completely could mean something different. No, it's interesting, too, the line about the hotel lobby, you know, masturbating with a magazine. Um, Also, in the context of the movie, I don't know if you remember, but Apollonia was living in a hotel. Mm -hmm. So I think that also points to the fact that Nikki is the, you know, what became the Apollonia character. I mean, it makes sense, right? That he's referring to where he met her, right? A strong opening from Prince. But I, I will, I will say... This is also one of the, well, I mean, a lot of this song confused me when I was much younger, but masturbating with a magazine. So, hmm, does that mean using a magazine (laughs) as a masturbatory aid, like visual aid, or as as a potential uh, tool, you know? It could go either way, right? I mean, but at the time, I really had no idea. How does one masturbate with a magazine? What does that even look like? (laughs) I have to go with with option A. Like, B just seems so unlikely, but... (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it does, however. Just the danger of paper cuts alone, I would... um, I would to go with A, but, yeah, you're right. Open to interpretation, because it's with the magazine, you're right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, yeah, it it confused the hell out of me as a kid, because I really didn't... You know, I mean, like, the specifics about how... That even I wasn't familiar enough with female genitalia that I could even begin to understand what that meant. I just knew it meant something dirty and maybe something that, um, you know, could only adults understood. And it was it was above my head. But 
I knew I knew it in its context it was dirty. That's all I would. Yeah. That's all I knew. And then the last line where he says, "I could not resist when I saw little Nikki grind." That that was another one from my perspective as a youngster. I had no idea what grinding meant. I mean, I knew the literal term of grind, you know, like you take something and you turn it into something in smaller pieces by grinding it. Right. Uh, I had no idea what it meant from in a sexual context, though. No clue. Oh, my God. I feel so bad for little Jason. He must have been so amazing. <laughs> just imagine <laughs> 11, your 11-year-old self just, what? <laughs> no worries, though, because, uh, it, like I said, it, my friends and I were very big fans of Purple Rain. I had, like, two or three good friends that lived in my neighborhood that were about my age. We were all big fans of this this record, and we would listen to the song, and we would, um, like, think, okay, so what do you think? What In what position do you think they're in when they're grinding? Is that different? Oh. And Is that different than, <laughs> I don't know if we use the word fuck, but is that different than, you know, like, traditional examples of sex that you would see on TV with the man on top of the woman. I mean, it was grinding like some really kind of out there sex position. We just didn't know. Right. So wait, you guys actually got together and tried to analyze this like <laughs> <sit> together. Um, <laughs> this is great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it. It, kind uh. it, it was for, for a little while there, there was, um, it was definitely this was the biggest thing, you know, like this was the yeah. big popular culture thing. Yeah. Out there in late eighty four. Oh. And um we were we were in deep with it. We were <laughs> dissected. Well, I think, you know, people knew the term like grinding kind of on the dance floor, you know, <laughs> like two people dr- grinding on the dance floor maybe would make more sense as a as a visual or something, I think maybe, yeah, that would, it's something you could picture. Right. But, um, yeah, I think, I think too, there's something about a woman grinding her hips, <laughs> you yeah. know? But, yeah. You can, you, I mean, as adult, yeah, I get it now, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. we were overthinking it. <laughs> okay, good. So I don't need to explain it now. Right. Okay. We're good. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay, excellent. <laughs> I think anybody listening to the song can kind of understand what that means now. <laughs> The song um, has these verses, and, and the chorus is just Nikki. But there is, they go. He, Prince goes through them pretty quickly. There is no chorus between verse one and verse two. He just sings verse one, and then you have the do 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 do, and then it goes into the next verse. But the second verse is, "She took me to her castle, and I just couldn't believe my eyes. Okay. She had so many devices, everything that money could buy. She said, sign your name on the dotted line. The lights went out." And Nikki started to grind. Damn, that is good writing. I love that. You know, sign your name on the dotted line. All right, that's classic. It's like, okay, sign the waiver. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whatever happens to you from here, I can't be held responsible for. <laughs> exactly. That's that's kind of how I've always, I, I shouldn't say always, that's how I've interpreted that line as, you know, uh, an adult, uh, basically an adult. Yeah. Is, because we're gonna we're gonna have some pretty freaky sex and it's <laughs> and injuries are, are potential. To there happen. could be levers and pulleys and we don't even know what all else. So yeah, I mean. Well, she, yeah, she had so many devices, right? I mean, that's <laughs> once again, it's a it's a line that doesn't tell you much, but it also says a lot. The castle too. I mean, honestly, this is just such great imagery. I love Prince's story songs. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, maybe maybe there should have been an emotional waiver as well because I think there was emotional fallout after this one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I would also say like this this verse because of the use of the certain words like castle and devices. For me, it brings to mind almost like a gothic kind of uh, i don't know like um thinking of like literal castles with like torture devices in place uh, yeah um you know like you think of uh, i'm thinking of like edgar Allan poe like dark uh type stories where <laughs> dark some, yeah. yeah like really really kind of kind of frightening imagery and, and instead of erotic it almost is like trying to be a little scary at times and then the yeah. lights went out so it's dark literally dark Yep. I wonder if Prince ever went to this nightclub in New York called Excalibur, which was it was like a big castle and there are all these rooms and there are people doing things that, you know, you maybe popped your head and kept on moving, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, we know 
Prince was in New York a lot. He frequented clubs. He uh, maybe maybe that evoked. Um, yeah, when you said castle and the dungeons and there were there were nightclubs that definitely you know skewed this direction uh, yeah. in this era. So interesting, yeah. interesting. Uh, interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, there's who's to say, but it's certainly in the within the realm of possibility that could have been an inspiration for this verse. Oh yeah. For sure. As well okay. as just just a vivid imagination too. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're I think we're finding all sorts of layers of meaning in this. This is gonna be good. Okay, what you got next? <laughs> yeah, so I think like at this point we get to finally get the chorus where he, really the chorus is just him saying Nikki. Yeah. So she you know the lights went out, Nikki started to grind, and then you get the, the music again, he just says Nikki. And first two then bleeds into the next three. So in verse three, he's now it's after. So the lights went out. Nikki started to grind. So they basically are. He's saying they they had sex or they're having sex. And so verse three is kind of like him just trying to describe in the best way he can his experience with Nikki. You know, the first couple of verses were the lead up. You know how they met and then you know where she took him. But now verse three, uh, he sings it in a little different different style than he did the first two verses the castle started spinning or maybe it was my brain i can't tell you what she did to me but my body will never be the same Mm. her loving will kick you behind oh she'll show you no mercy but she'll sure enough sure enough show you how to grind (laughs) and uh i I always heard okay so i kind of always heard where she'll sure enough show you how to grind i always kind of show enough (laughs) show enough Yeah. yeah I agree. So, I mean, I'm going to take a look at what the, how the lyrics were written on the record. Does it say sure enough or show enough? So as I'm looking at that, Laura, what are you, what are you taking away from verse three? What are some of the things that you like to well, think about? Brain is spinning. Okay. And the castle. And uh, yeah, I think it's just this uh, weird out of body kind of experience that he's having. Yeah. And this is where, as you alluded to, he could be more explicit, but he he dances around that, right? Yeah. I mean, he's sure. set it up. He set up the visual. Now, now it's up to your imagination what's going on. And I will um, mention here in I'm looking at the vinyl copy that I have of Purple Rain, and it does say "show enough." S H O. Yes. So, so, okay. so my ears weren't deceiving me. It sounds because the way he sings it, you. She'll show enough, show enough, show you how to grind. Yeah. Um, so the way it's written on Genius Lyrics is sure enough, but I'm glad that my hearing wasn't <laughs> failing me after all this, all these years. So right. I correctly. So anyway, yeah, so Castle Spinning, maybe it was his brain. So really he's kind of like feeling a little bit intoxicated, I guess, by this encounter. Like, you know, the room when, the, when you're really kind of drunk, the room starts to spin and it's yeah. a little bit disorienting and... Uh, but he, I don't think I don't get the sense. I mean, he's never they've never mentioned any alcohol involvement or any drugs. It's all just been very much very sexually um, driven like this encounter. And it hasn't sure there may be some devices, but never mentioned like there's going to be any um, chemistry involved besides just between two humans, I guess. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's it's basically kicking his ass, you know. <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. I mean, is kicking is his ass. Definitely where you go. Okay. Is it, are we talking like sadism, massacre? What are we talking about here? Right. It just, it leaves uh, a lot up to question and um, yeah, bondage, everything, everything is um, fair game. I yeah, guess in Nikki's castle. Yes. And that's what I, that's why I feel like this song is brilliantly written because it doesn't tell you everything you need to know. It right. just tells you enough. You can use your own imagination to fill in the blanks. And that is that is a really great way of telling a story. I mean, sometimes sometimes songs, story songs are very direct. They give you exactly everything line by line. But not not, not this song, not this song at all. Right. Uh, every verse, every verse has questions that go along with it. I mean. You know, verse one, hot, you know, masturbating with a magazine has a lot of questions about what does that look like? You know, how is she able to masturbate in a hotel lobby without 
getting arrested, you know? Um, lots of questions. I mean, I have so many questions about that, but. <laughs> I do too. I actually, yeah. <laughs> but yes, you're right. I mean, there's, it's kind of the power of illusion, right? To allude to things and then let your imagination just run wild. And I mean, that's any, you know, any good sexual encounter has, you, you have to have imagination, right? You have to use your imagination and creativity. And I think Prince is, you know, he's giving plenty of fodder for that in this mm -hmm. song. Yeah. And then in verse two, you know, the, just the comment about, having so many devices everything that money could buy signing name on the dotted line i mean those are all leads to even more questions that don't get answered like what kind of devices are we talking like s and m are we just talking very generic sex toys that existed in the 80s why i mean was there literally a signing on the dotted line or was this kind of just kind of a, a metaphor for something else like asking somebody about their sexual history, medical. I mean, there's just so many questions that are that come up with these lines in this song. Uh, yeah. you can take them so many different ways. What is what does he really mean by this? What exactly happened here? And we don't ever know. And then in the third verse, you know, he says, I can't tell you what she did to me. <laughs> you can't tell me because you don't want to. You can't tell me because it's indescribable. I mean, because <laughs> your head um, was spinning and you don't really know. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember because yeah. everything just was kind of a blur. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's there's so many questions that Prince brings up here that that never get addressed, never get answered, and I love that about this song. I love that he doesn't explain in detail the sex positions they were in, or explain in detail the types of devices that were used. Being told explicitly what happened. Would that make for a compelling song? I don't know if it would. No, I think it would take away the power of the song. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's great. Is Like you said, is signing on the dotted line, is that literal? Did she have a form? Was she a professional? I don't know. <laughs> or or is it a metaphor for, you know, yeah, he agreed, right? He, he acquiesced to whatever was going to happen. So um, I, I tend to think it's probably all a lot of metaphorical. But, yeah, it's it's great that he plays with it. He's It's a very playful song. Song, you know he's he's letting you fill in the blanks mm -hmm. yeah and it just goes back to once again i think a comment that was made earlier about this being a very sexually liberating song for women because she's 100 percent taking ownership of this encounter she's yep. not beholden to him for anything she's taking him to her place signing her forms <laughs> using her devices she'll kick your behind because whatever she's doing is you know I mean, obviously, pleasure between both of them, mutual pleasure is the goal, should be the goal of any sexual encounter. But if it ultimately isn't pleasurable to him, OK, she's going to get hers. Right. I mean, that's kind of what I get yep. from this is if if he gets something out of it, bonus, but she's going to get hers. Yeah, um, it, it's so true. It's like um, it's she's got an agenda. She's got a, you know, she's got a deal. She, you sign your name on the dotted line and, um, you know, go into the abyss <laughs> because you just plunge into it. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, and ultimately, I think this song kind of leads you back to uh, we'll get to it at the end with the backwards message. But, you know, what's it was it really this kind of edifying experience that he longed for or was it just this seductive abyss? you know that he fell into but uh, yeah it's a very evocative story song mm -hmm. then we get to the fourth verse after another round of course darling nikki and, and now the encounter is over um, he spends the night and mm -hmm. what we get is woke up the next morning nikki wasn't there i looked all over and all i found was a phone number on the stairs <laughs> that thank you for a funky time call me up whenever you want to grind ah. Great line. Yep. And even in the movie, he climbs up these um, steps 
And there's actually an, a piece of paper on the top step that he picks up and looks at, right? And it mm -hmm. it reminded me of a story that Carmen Electra told that um, when she was dating Prince, that he would get up in the middle of the night and um, just disappear. And he would go to work, right? He would go down to the studio. And she said that he would leave her notes on the stairs. Come find me. I couldn't sleep. I'm um, you know, whatever. I just thought, oh, it's so sweet. It's like what he actually did this again later in life, you know, leaving notes for your lover on the stairs. It's sweet. I don't know if it was sweet in Nikki's case, but <laughs> 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 I like I, I liked it. It was fun to see him act it out in Purple Rain. You, yeah, you know, for yeah. sure. He's climbing. Like you said, he's climbing those stairs to get on top of the amps. Yes. Uh, and that's when he gets like down on his hands and knees and, and then he pantomimes uh, humping the, the amp later on during the the musical portions of it after this fourth verse. But yeah. this fourth verse is kind of like supposed to be a little, you know, it's the next day. And I imagine like in the in the story of this song, he's kind of woken up from this really amazing slash scary encounter. <laughs> and uh <laughs> He right. doesn't really know how to feel, you know? I think he's just kind of, like, in a daze a bit is what I get from this. And the whole fact that, you know, she it's her place, but, you know, she has stuff to do. She has probably to go to work or whatever. Regardless, she didn't want to be around when he woke up, right? Right. Uh, there's this, this kind of awkwardness about the next morning, especially maybe during a one-night stand, where, you know, you, you got what you wanted from each other, but you don't really want to do the goodbye thing. And the easiest yeah. way to say goodbye to a one night stand is to <laughs> leave a note. You know? That's right. <laughs> no. That's right. It's like he's been transported to this whole other dimension, you know, with this experience. And then he afterward, there's nothing left to do except go to sleep, I guess, you know, and um, and then he wakes up and you're back kind of in the real world again and she's gone. And it's uh it's very evocative. This is a very specific verse again, right? This is not leaving tons up to the imagination. No, no. This is like I gave examples in the first three verses of all the questions that one can have by the lines delivered. This one doesn't really leave any questions open too much. I mean, yeah, you wonder where did Nikki go, but it doesn't really matter. That's not the point point is she she what they say ghosted she she, yeah. she got the hell out of there <laughs> so to allow to allow prince or the kid or whomever to grab his stuff get dressed and um get get the hell out because i mean she's not being mean about it i mean the, the note is complimentary thank you for a funky time call me up whenever you want to grind i mean if she really didn't enjoy it or didn't think that he was up to her standards then she just would have said something different, you know. She would have, wouldn't have left her number. It would have just been yeah. like, okay, thanks, see yourself out. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I guess I guess it would. I get you're right. You're right. And it's kind of matter of fact, right? It's very. It's not very emotional. It's just no. like tran like you said, transactional. It's transactional. Yeah. Deal done. You want to do the deal again? Let me know. Yep, exactly. And that's I think kind of really why the song is hurtful to Apollonia in the movie because she obviously doesn't see their relationship as transactional. She thought, like, you know, there was potential feelings there. They mm -hmm. had some good moments in the film leading up to their fight that led up to the song being performed. But, but the cold way that Prince performs it and the, um, the way it's kind of delivered as, as, as it being such a transactional and a, and a, feelingless emotionless experience yeah uh leads her to think like does this guy think that i'm i'm using him for sex or vice versa is he using me and he's just blaming me for how this all went down by putting yeah. me as is quote unquote nikki in the song i think you know it's it's really in the in the movie i think that the kid is just saying you betrayed me you know by going to morris and I don't think she saw it that way that but you know because she she hadn't had an intimate relationship with Morris but you know she he saw it as a huge betrayal mm -hmm. and and this was yeah this was his way of getting revenge okay well is this just a transaction like you know 
your career is just transactional too. So you're just going to go where it makes sense for you and, um, you know, not consider me or my feelings fine. Then, you know, that's how it's going to be. So yeah, two people um, can play at that game, right? I mean, Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of what I get from what he's saying as well. Like two can play that game. If you're looking at using Morris to further your career in spite of how it affects me, then yeah, I mean, sure, I'll, I'll hit you up the next time I want a booty call, but I'm not going to put any, I'm not going to invest any emotion in this if you're not, you know, if you don't care either. So here's a song about it. <laughs> yep. At this point, then the, the chorus is a little different, or maybe it's, you know, just like a, a bridge of sorts. He goes, uh, come back, Nikki, come back. You dirty little prince wants to grind, 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 grind. He repeats that over and over. But mm-hmm. And you mentioned this scene in the film and mentioned these lines already. So uh, the thing about this, he says these, he kind of, I mean, he's screaming these lines in, in the song in a way that, you know, he's trying to get somebody's attention, trying to get her attention. You know, in the film, he's, she's turned around walking out. And so he has to kind of scream at her to, to, hey, hey, I'm talking to you, that kind of thing. And in the song, he calls himself Prince, which, whatever, he's not the kid in the song. You dirty oh, you're right. <laughs> oh, I hadn't thought about that. He references Prince. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it'd be kind of weird to, I mean, I don't know. If it was me, it'd be kind of weird to call yourself a character's name in a song you wrote. I'd just, it'd be kind of weird for me. Wow. So I can see why he did it, but yeah, it doesn't match. It doesn't match. But the thing yeah. is, these lyrics are very hard to understand, right? Right. They're pretty hard to understand because he's screaming them so frantically and loudly. The fact that he says "wants to grind," you know, "dirty little prince wants to grind," I couldn't have told you that's what he said years ago without the wow. help of internet lyrics. I just heard, you know, screaming. And didn't know there was what the words were that he was saying. Because you know, sometimes people just scream in songs and they're not actually words. They're just noises, you know. Right. Just, just noises to evoke an, a, a feeling or, you know, for an emotion through noises. But I guess these are these are actual lyrics. I never knew that for the longest yeah. <laughs> There are some pretty good screams, I got to say. These are some uh, pretty epic print screams. So, you know, right after Beautiful Ones, they ranking right up there. Mm-hmm. Some of the best, uh, best print screams. But, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's just the agony, right? The pain that you feel in these, in these screams and the anger. Um, yeah, it's an angry song. For sure. And you feel that in these screams at the end. They come to like a uh, sort of there's no peaceful conclusion of this song. It's just, you know, boom. And then he's out of there. Yeah. He's he's desperate. He wants her back already. You know, I mean, yeah. so so whatever she did to him, like he talks about in the third verse, it it affected him. It certainly stuck with him and it and it he's almost like now a bit of a, an addict, you know, for for this kind of, this kind of sex and, you know, the intensity of the sex that he had with Nikki, she's transformed him in a way and opened his eyes to, um, you know, a way of, of sexual liberation showed him things that, that turned him on and he's addicted. He's a bit of, he's a bit addicted to it is what I get from this. The fact that he's asking her to come back this quickly, like they didn't have, you don't get the sense that they had a real deep emotional connection. He's hooked on mm-hmm. uh, Nikki, what she's, uh, whatever she's selling. <laughs> That's for sure. But I always thought when I heard it, like you said, it was really hard to make out, you know, and not reading the liner notes. I thought he was saying your darling little prince. Yeah, I guess because of Darling Nikki. It, it was hard to hear what he was saying. Your Darling Little Prince wants to grind, grind, grind. It was. It makes more sense as dirty. I like that. But um, but yeah, it's it's hard to make out amongst the screaming. But it's um, it's again kind of like the beautiful ones where he's begging, you know, come back, um, or choose me. It's a it's a he puts himself in a really vulnerable position with uh with these lyrics which is really what was unusual to see a man um portray himself as as that vulnerable um sexually uh at the time so it was uh, this this song was sort of earth shattering for a lot of reasons 
Mm -hmm. I do need to clarify something. You're right. You're absolutely right. The lyric isn't dirty. It's darling. You're darling little. Yes. And this is frustrating because I'm looking at genius because it's easier to read the lyrics on genius lyrics than it is on my copy of Purple Rain because of the way he's got his cursive writing and it's in purple over a dark background. Oh. But it says darling. So Does I, it? I, don't know, I don't know why it would be incorrect on the Internet when there's printed lyrics that have been available forever. Oh, my gosh. You, you heard correctly. You heard correctly. Well, that's a first because normally I hear it wrong. So, OK, score one. <laughs> yeah. And then to your point, it makes it makes perfect sense for it yeah. to be darling, your darling little prince, because now he's taking that that title <laughs> away from her. Yes. She's not darling Nikki, he's darling Prince. So yeah, your darling little Prince wants to grind, grind, grind. So it, I mean, it doesn't really change the the way that the section of the song comes across. That he's still very desperate, still very much addicted to what she gave him in that encounter. It's just just a different um, descriptive term used yeah. to describe him. It's more parallel because it it puts him on the same level as her. Right, so he's describing her as darling Nikki. Well, at the end, he's darling Prince. Mm-hmm, so exactly. He's yeah, he's he's bought into this whole thing, and he, yeah, he's um, yeah, it's it's beautiful writing. It's really well done. It's you know, I thought a lot about the fact that Prince's father, John Nelson, you know, played um, you know he was he played a lot of jazz clubs and other kinds of clubs around Minneapolis and. Um, strip clubs among them and this song just reminded me so much of I just wondered if Prince had had sort of seen these clubs and his father playing and the atmosphere because it has that atmosphere right of you know there's a little seediness to it there's like you know it it evokes that for me it's a it's a great song and um I, I just wonder if, like you, you know, as a as a younger guy, you know, Prince Prince experienced some of this, and he was evoking it for for this song. Oh yeah, it could be. And yeah. I, when you said it's a little seedy, I I would definitely agree with that. This song feels like it's um, should be like behind behind the counter, uh, like if you're <laughs> yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, if you're at a grocery yeah. store or a pharmacy or something and they have like the stuff behind the counter or if you like at a video store back in the day, that little back room. I mean, it feels like it kind of oh, belongs yeah. there. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Ah, true. Yeah. It's like the back room behind the beads. You know, you have to go through. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's really not not about the actual words as it is about the feeling that the song evokes and and just the the music combined because the music is very kind of like pulsing and intense um, with the keyboard and the drums just do 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 it goes back and forth between and it almost, and the music can almost be looked at as kind of very sexual as well with you know the you know, fast and slow and you can kind of draw parallels between intercourse and how that is can be very rhythmic um, just the way the music also kind of delivers that same vibe of it being a bit seedy and i think it's the combined the 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 combined lyrics and music together yeah i agree yeah musically i think the music is fairly is it kind of simple it's a very sing-song melody right and i guess we're not here to analyze the music but the verses are the verses are the music and the verses are very simple but then it gets it gets much more um, involved in the choruses and especially mm-hmm. at the end, the drums and the synths and the guitar, it's all kind of intertwined there in the chorus because it's like the, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that part is simple musically. Yes. Agreed wholeheartedly. Right. But then once it amps up to the chorus, dun, 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 you know, and it's like, dun, 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 you got the drums in the background, just really getting intensely pounded um, I think that duality of a very simple and slow and kind of, you know, not very musically adventurous verses, then you get to the chorus and it just completely flips you, flips itself around uh, to do something very unique and cool sounding is, is I think a lot of why this song is appealing from a musical standpoint, yeah. just because it's, it changes so much and it leaves you guessing, it leaves you 
to absolutely guessing on what's coming going to come next. I mean, it's a rock song, isn't it? I mean, don't you feel like it's almost like it could be a heavy metal song? Yes. Yeah, like, well, I mean, you know, you bring up a good point because one of the the more famous, um, more well known covers of this is by uh, a rock band, Foo Fighters. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They, they oh, were able yeah. to do oh, an interpretation crazy. of this song that is very um, rock heavy. So absolutely yeah. on point with that. Yes. And that pissed off Prince, right? So he, he then took the Foo Fighters song, Best of You, right? And did it at the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it pissed him off or not, or he just was like, well, you're going to take my song, you know, just kind of like in that Prince way. Yeah. Let uh, me show you. Touche. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'll, I think uh, it pissed him off because I don't think he liked anyone covering his songs, but, you know, <laughs> just a guess. But, yes, he uh, definitely the touche happened during the Super Bowl. Right, but, right. I mean, that, in my opinion, that's the best way to handle it is just, hey, you know what? I'll just take one of your songs and I'll do <laughs> my thing to show you it. how this should be played. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's just the one-upsmanship. Yep. It's very good at. That's right. Okay, so... After that section about um, your darling little prince wants to grind, 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 then you get a bunch of, of music and the song kind of reaches its, its climax, pun intended. Oh, nice. Okay. And then and then you get you, this kind of like this rain and wind sound. Uh, oh, it, it changes yeah. completely at this point, right? I mean, you, the music completely ends. Boy, it's really just kind of like these ambient noises like i always interpret it as like wind and rain yeah uh, is that what you got from it as well yes it, it like free remember this happened to us in free mm -hmm. before we heard the soldiers marching it sounded like whoosh, whoosh. yeah okay so we're back to those sound effects yep back to the sound effects and then we get that that kind of infamous um back masked vocal section of the song and you, you just you're just not for many for many 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 i can't even count how many years i had no idea what was going <laughs> on in this all i heard was really odd sounds that were not discernible words at least from the english language yeah. so i didn't know if it was being sung in a different language i didn't you know but uh, you could also kind of hear that telltale sound of music being played backwards or words sounds being played backwards so i was kind of like eh, this feels like backward singing in ways but i really never knew what it was all about it was just kind of like a really cool weird uh way a uh, cool weird coda to to this song with no explanation i think there was a whole you know in the zeitgeist of the time there was this whole thing about satanic messages especially on heavy metal albums, you know, that, you know, there are always these rumors, oh my gosh, if you play the song backwards, it says this, you know, and there's kind of this danger, intrigue kind of vibe about it. And um, yeah, but Prince kind of turned that on his head, right, by what the um, the words actually were when you oh, yeah, yeah. play it backwards. Exactly. I, there's no There's no satanic message here because the words actually are, hello, how are you? I'm fine, because I know that the Lord is coming soon, coming, coming soon. <laughs> so you couldn't really get any further away from a satanic message being hidden in a song than those lines, really. I mean, <laughs> he's talking about the wow. coming of the Lord. Wow. Yeah, that, you know, that's unexpected, to say the least. And mm -hmm. it's, again, I mean, um, yeah. Yeah. Here we go, Prince, spirituality, sexuality, it's a big mashup for him, you know, and and I, I do think it's really interesting how, how this whole story song, you know, describes this, you know, sexual encounter, there's no, you know, as you said, there's no emotional connection between Nikki and, and Prince, at least not described in the song, it's transactional, but then at the end, there's... I don't know. It's just this feeling of, um, you know, what might be what maybe what's missing from from that from that transaction is just this higher connection. And yeah, yeah I, I it, it's it's a perfect coda really to the song. It, it really is. I don't I don't do you in, in real time. Do you remember? Did, did you ever were you ever able to play it backwards? 
Did oh, you? no, no. I never heard. Yeah. Never heard. It's really kind of hard to play a record backwards to the point where you can hear messages. I mean, because yeah. you got to kind of, at least I never had any other way to do it than spin it backwards, look the needle on the record, and then spin it the wrong way yeah. with your fingers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then you're gonna scratch it or something. Yeah, it's just it's just not real easy to do. It's not easy no. to do at all. And then to get it at the right speed so it doesn't sound so it's not too slow or too fast, so you can actually understand the words. Very difficult. So it took. That's why I said it took many, 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 many years because it always just remained one of those unanswered mysteries, like unsolved mysteries. What the hell was Prince saying in the song? <laughs> actually say how it sounds on the record like i i'm sure i have it memorized just the incomprehensible ooh wop wop you know <laughs> the mm-hmm. whole strangeness yeah. of it but yeah it's just a backwards message and it, it it's you know i guess i kind of see it as like the yearning of um prince for an ultimately you know maybe a more edifying experience or 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 just you know the combination of the experiences just connecting the two in a way that um people at the time did not i don't i think this you know his whole theme of sexuality and spirituality that erica thompson writes so beautifully about was um was very much ahead of its time and this is another example of it very cool ending yeah, it sounds a bit like gospel to me. Like it's um I get I get visions of like a gospel choir sitting out in the rain or standing out in the rain singing this song is kind of like a a soundtrack ending to this, uh, this yeah, bizarre yeah. encounter that Prince had with Nikki. Uh I it's just it, it's just one of those weird visions that I get the way the song ends this way and and being sung backwards kind of also to me has always felt like a lot of this is like a dream in some ways. Like it's kind right. of like a, a waking dream where everything that happens is just so kind of bizarre, you know, how that, how the encounter is so um, in your face, like this woman is masturbating in a hotel lobby, which is fucking weird. And <laughs> then, and then to go into this encounter that is, you know, everything that most men would ever dream of, but also kind of scared of at the same time. It's like, uh, you, yeah. you, you want a woman that's really sexually aggressive, but do you really? I mean, <laughs> is, it, is it kind of scary at the same time? Because that is not traditionally the the role that has been played by women in in terms of sex, whether or not right or wrong. It doesn't really matter. I think a lot of people look at it like, well, the guy's supposed to be the aggressor and the guy's supposed to be the one that calls the shots. Well, that's that's not really true. And it never, never probably really was. I think that's just uh-huh. like what stereotypes and false um, identification of what masculinity is. And then it's just all very dreamlike in some ways. And this ending being sung backwardly, it has like, I don't know if you're that familiar with uh, the works of like uh filmmaker david lynch or something yeah. like that but yeah i love him yeah <laughs> you know oh, yeah. like a very twin peaks vibe to it mm-hmm. you know? trying to say it trying to tell you something i'm trying to tell you something but it's being told backwards because you're in a, you're literally in a dream right now and you don't even know it it's <laughs> so good yes good parallel i think Prince was a fan of David Lynch too. It's um but that, had, yep. this, that would have been a little later maybe, but yeah, Blue Velvet and all that. But yes, yeah. definitely it it reminds me too of a door where um he's talking about, you know, they're making love and the angels see them and and tears of joy pouring down on them. You know that that like you're saying, the gospel voices and the the sounds of water. It's just, yeah, it's very similar to me to adore in that way. And I think it's very, you know, thinking about this now from, you know, perspective 35 years later. It's, I mean, it's extremely ironic that it was a female, right, Tipper Gore, who was so outraged by, you know, female like this description of female masturbation that she had to you know take this and and make this sort of he became prince became sort of the poster i don't know if the word poster child or you know example like make him an example Mm -hmm. Um, and it was a female who did that you know which which just seems i guess it's typical but um 
I feel like Prince was making an effort, you know, to um, kind of give this platform for for women and um, to open things up for female sexuality. And then it was a woman who. Well, I mean, it's the same down. thing that happened with him and Pussy Control. Uh-huh. In the 90s. That song was was misidentified as potentially being misogynistic. And yeah, it wasn't interpreted the right way by, by many people who were just just looking at it from the yeah. courts. Yeah. And I think Darlie Nikki was misidentified as well as maybe potentially being a bit misogynistic because of its, you know, shame, trying to shame the person for, for enjoying sex. And we both know neither of these songs are really meant to be anything but female empowerment songs. Yeah, that's true. I, I'm, and I'm sure, you know, at the time people just fixated on the word masturbating and that was enough. <laughs> to yeah, shut it up. Right. So I, I don't think it probably went too much deeper than that, but um probably not. Yeah. I do find okay. a little bit of irony in that. So and anyway. I also like the fact that this ending section, which is backwards, is is really a, a you know, lyrics about God and the coming of the Lord. Because it's another example of purple in the at context of purple rain of there being hiding in plain sight, Prince is hiding in plain sight his spirituality. Yes. Uh, it was hidden pretty good in Let's Go Crazy with the elevator and all of the references to the devil yeah. and how we're not going to let let him bring us down. Um, so Let's Go Crazy had it hidden in plain sight. It's hidden in plain sight right here. You know, if you just have the means to turn these words forward, you can hear he's talking about he's happy because the Lord is coming soon. And then, of course, I would die for you, hidden in plain sight, and a song that can be interpreted entirely as a song about Jesus Christ. So, yeah, you're right, Jason. I mean, what's stunning now, looking back, is that Prince felt that he couldn't talk about God in popular music. So he, instead of saying God, he had to say, "Let's go crazy." Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, he he talked about that in his memoir in the beautiful ones. I mean, he specifically said, let's go crazy is God. But he said, I couldn't say it at the time. It couldn't it wouldn't get played on the radio. So, you know, yeah, we're talking about masturbating with a magazine that got him shut down. Um, but equally talking about God he would have gotten him shut down in, in a different way. So it, it's. um Man, it, this is some groundbreaking stuff that he was doing and, and really fascinating to see um, how he managed to still communicate uh, these messages. Oh, um, yeah. He had to get super creative in order yep. to provide those messages, which he felt was really you know important to him to, to do that in a way that was that was still evident and still met his you know internal requirements to show his spiritual side and show his love for God, but doing it in a way that wasn't so uh, overt and also wouldn't turn off, you know, an entire portion of the population that was not religious. Um, You know, as he got older and his career went different directions, you know, some of that was less, you know, he felt less compelled to to do that. And sometimes it was just more, like I said, on the nose and really in your face. But during the Purple Rain era, he was still kind of straddling that line and, he felt like he needed to, he still felt the messages needed to be put out there. It was part of his songwriting and it was important to him, but definitely had to be creative about it. And I would say it sparked a lot of really cool songs and creatively was the the way to go. And this is a good, a great example of it for sure. It is. This is the way he hooked the masses in, you know, he reels them in. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and a lot of them followed along, you know, for what came next. So um, that's Purple Rain. It's amazing. Yes, the whole album is amazing. And Darling Nikki is an an amazing way to end Side A. And at this point, you know, we were pretty much at the end of of the the discussing of the lyrics. So, Laura, did you have any final thoughts on the song and any other additional points you wanted to make about the song's lyrics? I think I think we did Nikki justice. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I'm really eager to hear what listeners have to say and what you know if they have any additional interpretations of this uh, really groundbreaking song. Yeah, yeah, me too. That's it's great to have another person to bounce it off of, but it's also better to have thousands of people to bounce it off of. So. Please, listeners, if you have any additional thoughts on the song, if you think we missed something or 
you know, you had a different point of view from your experiences listening to the song, I'd love to hear it. Uh, you can get a hold of me at Press Rewind 75 on Twitter and Instagram. I also have a Facebook page, Press Rewind, Prince Lyrics Podcast. You can find me there. Or traditionally, you know, just go to my Press Rewind um, Blueberry account, which is where I host my podcast, and you can find me there. Also, I wanted to throw out there, if you enjoy the show, uh, I would love it. It would be very grateful if you guys could you know, throw a rating on Apple Podcasts or a like on any of the other ways that you listen to the show. It helps It helps a lot uh, to get the show out there, and I, I greatly appreciate that. I also appreciate Laura Tebert for joining me today, taking time out of your day to talk Darling Nikki with me. Um, Laura, how can people get a hold of you? What, what are you up to? Oh, yeah, you can um, follow me at um, Laura Tebert, which is uh, T-I-E-B like boy, E-R-T, um, at Laura Tebert on uh, Twitter or Instagram, um, Laura Tebert on Facebook, and uh, lauratebert.com is my blog where I am currently writing about my experiment in living like Prince for a year. Yes, I've been following that. <laughs> Last year, throughout the 2019, fascinated by what what you did, and I think anybody who's interested in that should go check out Laura's blog because she goes through in very very unique detail all the different things that um, that she did throughout the year to kind of live like Prince in her own way, but also taking lessons from the man and how he lived his life and how he managed his own career. So it's it's fascinating stuff. So. Thanks again, Laura. I do appreciate you joining me. Thank you for having me. Okay, well, that is the show, Darling Nikki, Purple Rain. And until next time, thank you very much and goodbye. Goodbye.